The 14th of October, 1066, the most famous day in the history of England. And here we are at the battlefield where the events will take place. As you can see here, we've got a soldier carved of wood. But join me as I walk around the battlefield of Hastings. My name is Mark Wheatcroft. I'm a historian that creates regular content exploring over a thousand years of English history. My videos also cover the history of other countries that connect with England. Subscribe to my channel to keep up to date with all the latest releases. It's October 1066. The Norman fleet has landed at Pevensey, some approximate 15 kilometres people taking this direction. They've then built a fortification inside the former Roman shore fort there and then moved along the coast to Hastings off in this direction ahead of us approximately that way where they've constructed another fortification and a name that will be new to the English language castle. Now these castles were earthworks, mainly earthen banks with a wooden palisade on top to protect and then a small outer wooden fence to protect an, in an inner courtyard known as Motton Bailey Castles. To the north is Harold II of England and his men who have just come just completed their second false march in a number of weeks having already left the south coast while they were preparing for William's invasion to go north to fight a, a, a different invasion by the Viking king Harold Hardrada. So how do we get to this point here? Well it all begins in January of that year 1066 and the death of Harold of the King of England Edward the Confessor. Edward the Confessor dies heirless, childless, and so there's three completing claims to the throne. Harold, who will become, who will crown, be crowned the day of Edward's funeral, is the most powerful landowner in England. Is the head of the most powerful family, the Saxon family, and he is the son, the brother-in-law of the dead king. William, Duke of Normandy, who is a cousin of Edward the Confessor, through Edward the Confessor's lineage for his mother, Emma of Normandy. And during an early period of, Edward, of Edward's life, when England is under Danish rule, Dane rule, he spends and he grows up in the court in Normandy, in, Car in places like Carn and Falaise, and he's brought up almost as a stepbrother to William's father. And so that, and there's conflicting claims about a 1064 trip made by Harold to Normandy, and William uses this as a reason, uh, as one of the events that takes place there, as of it that Harold swore's fealty and allegiance to William and he's going to offer, give him and support his claim to the throne. The third king is Harold Hardrada, Harold Hardruller, King of Norway. His claim comes from that period under Viking rule in the early, in the early 11th century when we were being ruled by Canute his sons, half a Canute, and Edmund Ironside, and they will then, he's, he has a belief that he is ruler. So what happens is, is that news obviously arrives in Normandy that Havard has crowned himself king. When we say crowned himself kingship in the Anglo-Saxon period, is slightly different to than how we imagine it today and how it developed on into the latter medieval period. So kingship actually required the assent of the Witten or the council. And so Harold has been put forward 
and has been suggested by the Witten and that has been ratified and he has been made king, he has been crowned king. William hears of this and immediately orders an invasion force to be built and due to this episode that happened in 1064 he appeals to the Pope and he is given a Pope, papal banner to suggest that this is more than just a conflict it's actually a crusade to oust a king who is who is not ordained by God from his position the fleet's ready it's built they're waiting on the on the Normandy coast at a place called um, on the river Div and then they may eventually move along to the mouth of the river Somme a place called St Valerie sur Somme and which from where the invasion will eventually take place unfortunately for most of the summer for William the winds are blowing in, a, in an unfavourable direction. They're blowing. It's a northerly wind coming, so they can't sail north across the channel. But in the meantime, that wind that is preventing William from landing aids Hardrada, and he he lands in the in, in the Humber Estuary, and very quickly captures the city of York. Now York is the second most important city in medieval England, and so its capture is seen as extremely significant. Alongside Hardrada, though, is another member of the Godwinson clan. It's one of Howard's younger brothers, whose name is, is Tostig. Harold, he, he has been ousted by Howard himself from Edward the Confessor's court from his role as Earl of Northumbria. So that's anywhere north, north of the Humber. So that's York, that, that's mostly North Yorkshire. Northumberland on the eastern side of the Pennines there and so what he's what what so Harold takes his army that's down here in the south guard in the south coast marches it the 200 miles up to York and fights a major battle there and secures a hum, a tremendous victory he fights Harold at a place called Stamford Bridge which is just on the outskirts of York and now he secures a major victory in fact he, he took it. He, he takes him, but he takes Howard completely by surprise. And over, in the over the army that arrived in over 200 ships, only six was needed to take them back. Among the dead was Howard, Hardrada, and Toski. However, as they were co celebrating their victory in the north, news reached them that in the south, William had landed in Pevensey, and so a second force march was made back to this position. Back. To, first of all to London where initially Howard's mother argued to him not to go south however this is Howard's heartland down here and so he came charging down here to make the to, to fight William and to fight him so as morning broke on the 14th of October 1066 two armies are approaching at this spot so if we're going to walk around and follow it's around so we can get a better view and then we'll discuss the dispositions of the two armies as they formed up ready to begin the Battle of Hastings. So the early morning of the 14th of October 1066 the story is dominated by three hills or three ridge lines. So the hill in front of us where the great abbey stand, ruins stand is the hill that's going to dominate the story. However, if you go beyond that hill, through the town itself and out the other side, you'll come to another hill that was known as the Hill of the Hoary Apple Tree. And it is there on the evening of the 13th of October that Harold has consolidated his men and, oh, and then in the morning, of the 14th of October they move and take position here at the time on an unnamed ridge as you can see it's not particularly high it's reasonably steep but it's not a particularly high ridge and so it didn't dominate a name the, uh, the third ridge that we'll talk about is across in this direction and I'm just seeing if I can get to a position where you can see it at all but I think the tree coverage at the back of the battlefield here just 
is now just dominates it. everything's just a little bit too much but you can see hopefully you can see it sort of it, the, the ground dips down and it starts to rise up again and that hill is Tallam Hill and that is where for the troops that are arrayed here at, at Howard's troops will catch their first glimpse of the Norman army advancing towards them and that glimpse is more likely to be glinting of the sun off of armour helmets, spears, mail etc. But whilst we're here at this, loca at this position that gives us a good view along the ridge line you will hopefully get, we can discuss how the armies were arrayed now and deployed. Now Hastings as a battle is often referred to as old meeting new in terms of tactics. The Saxons on the ridge, the English, shouldn't be using Saxons at this time, the population of England had dramatically altered from the time of Edward, um, Alfred, the, uh, Edward, Alfred the Great. And so this is now an English population, it's not a Saxon only population. So Saxon by this term is an outdated term. So the English are arrayed on the ridge line here again. We have to bear in mind the Abbey Works and Construction has dramatically altered the landscape of this hill. Was it slightly steeper? What it, when we'll go up into the Abbey later you'll see that the hill does go up beyond that terrace line that we look at and that we see that kind of marks the edge of the hill you'll see it and it, when you get up there you'll see it goes up a lot steeper so was that more of a characteristic of the hill then than it is today however along that ridge line up where the abbey works are i say more than that terrace but beyond was the english army and now this english army is arrayed in what is known as a shield wall so that interlocking shield are going across the face and this is the old tactic that if you go back 200 years from ha from the battle of hastings to when alfred the great was fighting viking incursions in wessex the tactics that have been used would not be too dissimilar now down here in the fields to this down here at the bottom of the slope is where William's forces have arrayed and now William has the modern army shall we say this is three divisions deep you have archers on the front then his infantry and behind them his shock troops his cavalry and this is a type of fighting that the English will not have been exposed to they've been exposed to archers English had their own archers they had archers at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Unfortunately, when it comes to Hastings in the rush to get back here, archers were the poorest element of the army. They travel by foot. They're still on the road. They're still coming back. They haven't made it this far. William's archers are here. Then the infantry, they'll be used to infantry. They could fight infantry. It's that the fighting infantry in shield war is their bread and butter, and the Normans infantry tends to fight fairly similar in shield war, close proximity to each other. It's the cavalry. That's the new that that's the new weapon that they're going to be exposed to for the first time. And so as we move around, we will we'll take up the story a bit later. Around the battlefield we was over there a while ago up by those bushes. Uh, you sweep all the way around the trees, you, you lose sight of it for a good majority of that part of that walk. So we're now in and amongst where the Norman lines were. Um, obviously all these tree lines feature here wouldn't have been here. We don't know what the, what it was like. It's most likely to be sort of like open scrubland, more, almost like what you call moorland. Um, so go, maybe like gorse bushes. Um, probably not cultivated at all um, but some form of vegetation on here rather than just flat grass 
certainly the ponds that, are, that, that scatter around the back here um, that were, weren't there at the time, they were almost certainly dug as part of the construction of the abbey and we'll talk about the abbey construction later on but we've, whilst we're here let's discuss the actual battle itself so as I, was talking, as I mentioned earlier the Normans arrayed themselves in three ranks so archers at the front the um, the lightly armoured armed archers at the front the more heavily armoured infantry behind and then the he- their what we would could they could consider to be or uh, in later periods be called concerned as heavy cavalry but they mounted knights behind whilst the English were at the top of the ridge in their shield ball now William himself places himself in the centre of the battlefield alongside his two brothers Odo the Bishop of Bayer and Robert Cantor Matan, uh, these two half brothers I should say uh, so just to clarify that, on the ridge Harold himself is in the middle of his line and he's surrounded by both his brothers Leofric and Griff and they are positioned up there on the ridge line now as well as, be, as dividing his army in three divisions coming back he's also got them in three divisions left to right so on the far left hand side is the Bretons his Normans in the middle and then on the right, his other mercenaries. So sometimes it's written as French, sometimes it shows as Flanders. His wife Matilda comes from is 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 a, is a Flemish descent. So she obviously would use influence in her position to allow to gain uh, give William mercenaries. And as well as being husband and wife, they're also cousins of some description although it, it's hard to say exactly how what sort of level of cousin they are but they were related they did need papal blessing for the marriage to take place whilst he's here she's running normandy in his absence he's before he arrived he he um made his eldest son robert who will go down as robert kurt Hose, robert short trousers his heir to normandy although he's only a little boy so um, um, matilda is in effect regent in normandy at this time whilst william is on campaign and so the battle starts here on the morning of the 14th of july of october william sends his archers forward and orders them to put fire into the Saxon shield wall. Now the fire at this point is sort of fairly straight so they're aiming directly at <coughs> at the front rank and then the troops, his infantry will move forward. So I'm just going to read a bit from my book um, and this is William of Poitiers, William, William of Normandy's own, one of his chaplains who writes writes his accounts. It's one of the most important first-hand documents that we have of the invasion. So Poitiers writes, the terrible sound of trumpets announced on both sides the beginning of the battle. The Normans boldly and swiftly launch attack. Just as when speakers plead a case of theft before a judge, the plaintiff opens the proceedings. So the Norman infantry advance closer, provoking the English and causing wounds and death with their missiles. The latter resisted bravely, each according to their means. They throw javelins and all sorts of darts, the most lethal of axes and and stones fixed to pieces of wood. Under the deadly hail, you might have thought our men would be crushed. The mounted warriors came to the rescue and those who had been in the rear found themselves in front. Disdaining to fight from a distance, they rode in into battle using their swords. The great war cries, hear the, hear the Normans, there the barbarians, were drowned by the noise of the battle and the groans of the dying. So for a time, both sides fought ferociously. The English were greatly helped by their higher position, which they held. They did not have to, ha, have to march to attack, but they remained tightly grouped their numbers and their strength of their army as well as their weapons of attack which penetrated within 
with difficulty shield and the other pieces of armour were also to their advantage. So, so they resisted vigorously or repulsed those who dared to attack them at close quarters with swords. They even wounded those who threw spears at them from a distance. So frightening by such ferocity, the infantry and the Breton mounted warriors both retreated. With all the auxiliary troops who formed the left wing, almost the whole of the Duke's army yielded. In saying this, no shame is intended for the unconquered Norman race. The armies of Rome, in her, in her Majesty, even when they contained royal contingencies and however accustomed they were to victory on land or sea, sometimes retreated when they learned of their, that their leader had been slain or believed that he had been. The Normans believed that their Duke and Lord had been killed. Their retreat was not a shameful flight, but a sorrow withdrawal. The Prince, seeing the greater part of the enemy camp, setting out in pursuit of his men, held themselves in front of the fugitives and stopped them by, by striking them or menacing them with his lance. And then having, having uncovered his head and taken off his helmet, shouted, look at me, I'm alive and I will be a victor with God's help. What madness induces you to flee? What avenue of retreat is open to you? Those you cannot those could have slaughtered like sheep who have driven back, driven you back and are killing you. You are de deserting victory and inexcusable, inextinguishable glory to lose yourselves in flight and eternal shame. By fleeing, none of you will escape death. With these words, they re regained courage. At their head, he held himself forward with, with the lightning of his sword. He devastated the enemy nation with which rebelled against him, their lawful king, and deserved to be slaughtered. So that incident would be happening across this far side of the battlefield as we look at it now on the, Nor on the Norman left. It began on the Breton, in the Breton position and gradually swept down. So if you imagine this side of the army giving way, the Saxons, or the English, not the Saxons, chasing after them and then being slaughtered in the fields hereabouts and that's that location. So Potiers continues, strengthened in their resolve, they attacked with great, with increased vigour the enemy army which despite having sustained very great losses did not seem any less in number. The English confidently resisted with all their strength, striving above all to prevent a breach in their line, opening under the assault. Their extraordinary tight formations meant that those who were, ki who were killed hardly had room to fall. Even so, some breaches opened under the sword blows of the most doughty fighters. They were made by the men of Maine, the French Bretons, men from Aquitaine, but above all, by the Normans with unequal courage. A certain young Norman, Robert, son of Roger of Beaumont, nephew and heir of Hugh, Count of Moulin, through his mother, Adeline, was fighting that day for the first time. He carried out an exploit which deserves everlasting praise. At the head of the battalion at the right wing which he commanded, he attacked and brought down the enemy with great boldness. We cannot, nor do we intend to narrate everyone's exploits at this, as they merit. The most fertile, fertile writer, if he had been eyewitness to this war, would have had great difficulty in describing each small detail. And we will, and we wish to hasten to the finish, the praise of Count William in order to celebrate the glory of King William. And so we'll be looking at the right flank is in this position right here and then Poitiers continues seeing it will be impossible for them to overcome without great loss to themselves such a numerous enemy which offered a cruel resistance the Normans and their allies turned their backs pretending to take flight they remembered a little earlier flight had led to the success they desired. Among the barbarians who hoped that they were, they were victorious, 
there was a great there was the greatest rejoicing. They urged each other on with cries of triumph, whilst they abused men and threatened to hurl themselves as one on them. As before, several thousand were bold enough to rush forward, as if on the wings to pull to pursue those who who took who they took to be fleeing. When the Normans suddenly turned their horses' heads, stopped from their tra- stopped them in their tracks, and crushed them with. Com- completely and massacred them down to the last man. Having twice used this trick with the same success, they attacked with the greatest vigour the rest of the army, which still inspired fear and which was very difficult to surround. Then an unusual kind of combat ensued, one side attacking in bursts and in a variety of movements the other rooted to the ground, putting up with the assault. The English weakened, and as if they admitted their wrongdoing by defeat itself, they now undertook the punishment. The Normans shot arrows, wounded and transfixed men. The dead, as they fell, moved more than the living. Even the lightly wounded could not escape, but perished under the dense heap of of their companions. So fortune concurred in William's triumph by hastening it. So we're now moving further up the slope now towards the position of the English line. So as I said, it wasn't actually marked by the obvious line of the Abbey Wall Terrace, but it actually went on beyond there. And as you come up the hill, you can see that although actually small in height, it is in, in places particularly steep, so it would have given as Poitier has said in his, his writing, and as an advantageous position for the Saxon, for the English on the top of the hill. So where we're going to go now is past and up towards the Abbey. So we're not going to discuss the Abbey just at this moment in time, but we need to get into the Abbey grounds to tell the next part of the story. Come up and into the walled gar- one of the wall gardens of the Abbey and the reason I thought come into here is despite the um, the long length of the grass. As you can see, hopefully tell this is one of the steepest sections of the hill. And we've crossed the terrace which from at the bottom of the hill looking up the battlefield makes it look like the summit but as you can see here, it is still continuing going up, and it, gets, it does go up a, a reasonable, a reasonable gradient as well, and then up beyond the wall there um, is heading towards what's today known as Howard Stone. Um, but we're going to continue with Poitiers whilst in on this portion of the battlefield. So there took part in this ba- in this battle, Eustace, Count of Boulogne, William son of Richmond, Count of Evreux, Geoffrey, son of, of Rutro, Count of Mortang, William Fitzosborne, Amory, Viscount of Tours, Walter, Gifford, Hugh, Hugh of Montfort, Ralph de Tosney, Hugh of Grand, Grand Mesnil, William of Warran, and a number of others, outstanding for their eminence as soldiers and fame whose names should be written in history books among those of the bravest of warriors. As for William, their leader, he surpassed them in both courage and wisdom and should, be rightly, and should rightly be placed above some of the Greek and Roman leaders so highly praised in the records and treated as the equal of others. His leadership in the, in the battle was notable, preventing men from fleeing, inspiring courage in others, sharing danger more often ordering his men to follow him and to advance. From this it is clear that his courage opened the way for his soldiers and encouraged their boldness. A not inconsiderable part of the enemy army lost heart merely at the sight of his astonishing and frightening horsemen before they had sustained any injuries. Three horses were killed under him. Three times he he intrepidly leapt from the ground and hastened to avenge the death of his war horse. 
this shows his quickness, his strength of mind and body, and the fury of his sword pit of his sword pierced shields, helmets and halberds. He struck down several soldiers with, with his sword shield alone. His soldiers were astonished to see him fight and fought. Many already wounded found new courage from his example. Some needed weak some indeed weak from the loss of blood leaned on their shields and fought manfully. Others, unable to do more, encouraged their fellow, fellows to follow the Duke's fearlessness by shouts and gestures. At least they should let victory slip through their hands. He helped and rescued many of his men. William would have been no more afraid to meet Harold, with whom the poets compared to Hector or Turnus in single combat, than Alcides or Anurinus, the ancient adversaries of the two heroes. Tired as attacked that by fifty men used a rock to defeat him to defend himself. William, his equal, scarcely less well born, did not fear to meet a thousand single handedly. The other of Tribert Tribert and Anid, who after the fashion of poets make great deeds even greater in their books, should have found the real exploits of this man a better subject for verse and nearer to the truth. And if they had risen to the greatness of the topic, he made himself the subject of their songs. The beauty of their style would have earned him a place among the gods. But our feeble poet prose, which only proposes in humble fashion of the benefit of all us to relate his piety in worshipping a god, who alone is great, eternal to the end of time and beyond, must come shortly to the end of the story of the battle which he won justly and bravely. We now moved up to the final part of the site and they're in the heart of the Abbey complex itself. And as we move around we're going to go and visit a position. I'll just briefly talk about it and then I'll read more from the extract from Poitiers. So here in the heart of the Abbey complex, ruined Abbey complex after Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries stands this stone which is today known as Havard stone and this is the position that the high altar was placed at the centre of the abbey and it was here suppose it is a rumour spot that Havard met his death and so we're just going to go back into the grass area and we're going to read the extract about how he came how Havard came to his death At the close of the day, the English realised that they could no longer resist the Normans. They knew that they had been reduced in number by the death of many of their troops. The king himself, his brothers and the leading men of the kingdom had been killed. Those who remained were at the end of the struggle and there was no hope of relief. They saw that the Normans were hardly weakened at all by the death of those who had been killed and as they drew on new strength by fighting, they threatened them more fiercely than at the beginning. The Duke, in his fury, spared no one who opposed him, as if his valour as a soldier would only be satisfied by victory. So they fled and left the field as quickly as they could, some seizing horses, others on foot, some by roads, others across country, some covered in blood, struggling to flee, or were too weak to, or were too weak to do so. The desire to escape alive gave strength to some. Many died in their depths of in the depths of the forest. Their pursuers found corpses all along the roads. The Normans, although they could not did not know the countryside, pursued them eagerly, slaughtering the fleeing rebels, setting a seal on their victory amidst the de- amidst the dead, the horses who trampled all those who lay in their path. However, those who fled regained confidence when they found a deep valley and numerous ditches. For this race descended from the ancient Saxons, the most ferocious of men were always ready to cross swords. They would not have retreated except in the face of invincible force. They had just defeated with ease the King of Norway as the head of a numerous battle-hardened army. At the head of his victorious standards, the Duke seeing troops suddenly gathering and believing to be 
newly arrived reinforcements did not turn aside or halt more fierce and armed with the butt of his spear than those who were brandishing long javelins. He restrained by his manly voice, Count Eustace, who turned back with, with 50 mounted soldiers and was getting ready to sound the retreat. The latter whispered in the Duke's ear the advice that he should turn back, protecting the instant death if he continued. While he, was, while he said this, Eustace was struck between the soldiers by a blow whose sound and force showed themselves by blood flowing from his nose and mouth half dead. He only escaped with the help of his companions. The Duke's disdain, fear and failure attacked and overcame his adversaries in the conflict. Some of the most famous Norman warriors fell because the difficulty in the lie of the land meant that they could not show their usual courage. Having achieved his victory, the Duke returned to the battlefield, found the scene of carnage which he could only look at with pity, even though the victims were covered with cor even even though the victims were wicked men, and it is glorious and praiseworthy to kill a tyrant. The ground was covered with corpses for a vast distance, stained with blood. There were were the flower of the nobility and youth of England. Beside the king, two of his brothers were found. He himself, stripped of all marks of rank, was recognised not by his face, but by certain signs. He was carried to the Duke's camp, where the Duke entrusted William Mallet with the duty of burying him, but refused to hand over, the, over his body to his mother, who offered to pay his, its weight in gold. He was aware that it would not have been fitting to accept gold in exchange. He also thought that it would not have been fitting to allow a man to be buried in accordance with his mother's wishes, who by excessive greed had been responsible for the deaths of the men, of many who would never be properly buried. They said in jest that he should be made guardian of the shore and the sea, in which in his anger he had earlier occupied. And so the site here of the abbey was later constructed by we, uh, under the orders of William for penance for that day and for the blood that he had shed here. So the Abbey story continues the story of the battle site and that is another story for another day. But there's one last thing that we do need to discuss which I'll talk about in a moment. So there's two things we need to discuss before finishing the story. So first of all, and there are two controversial subjects in English history to an extent, and the first is how did Harold die? Now we all know the famed story of being struck by the arrow in the eye and this story mainly comes to us from the Bayer Tapestry and there is the scene within the Bayer Tapestry that shows the death of Harold. Now, what we are unable to presume is which of the, which of the figures is Harold. Is it the one being struck in the eye or is it the man falling under a mounted knight? Now, there is suggestion that it could actually be both. However, if you look at closely at the most latest version um, scan produced by the city of Bayer of the tapestry, which is a fantastic uh, resource to look at, it's available on their website. You can actually see that it looks as if the arrow in the eye may be a later addition and that the, the person who's been struck by the arrow in the eye may be the actually throwing a spear and that spear has been unstitched so we, 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 we don't actually know now even the writings are very vague on the cause of Havel's death as you'd heard in Poitiers writing so one of the people who was actually at the field at the time of the battle is even suggesting that he doesn't know how Havel was killed um, it's certainly believed that William gave the orders to a select number of knights to find and to kill Harold but again it doesn't necessarily mean to say that they were the knights 
they were the people who killed him. So unfortunately, as much as the common consensus now is that most people believe that those two figures are both Harold and that he was wounded by the arrow in the eye before being slain by the mounted knights. We just don't know and realistically we will never know. But also with nine, nearly 900 years of history stating that he was hit in the eye, it's very hard to backtrack that and so that's why most consensus is that he's, he's struck and maimed by the arrow in the eye prior to being felled by the mounted knights. Is most likely the, um, is the universally agreed course of events that leads to Havel's death. Now, the other controversial issue and elephant in the room here, as it is an English heritage site, do we know where the battle took place? Okay, so let's start with what we do know. William ordered the construction of a abbey to be erected on the site of Harold's death of the battle and it also took place at the site of the death of Harold. There, okay, right, so we're at that point. Another thing that we know from, it's not in this book, but it, it's in, as I said, whilst I was studying the Normans, is that initially an abbey was began to be constructed. William arrived at the location and said, no, this isn't the right location, and ordered it to be built elsewhere. Okay, so people who put forward the site at Crowhurst as an example of a possible secondary location for the battle, state that there's some abbey ruins there. Okay, so possibly that that was the start of the construction and then it was then moved here. Who would know? William. William ordered it to be moved, to be placed here because this is where it happened. So, does it place it on this hill? Yes. The area of the battlefield that we looked at that way does that does that necessarily dictate that's where the battle was not necessarily as you can see if you look this way it does slope off and then you've got Telham Ridge rising beyond it Colbeck Hill is over in that direction but so that's Telham Ridge behind there which is where the Normans were sighted so potentially they could be coming this way we don't know. Now, archaeologically, archaeology-wise, very little has been found on the site. In fact, one axid, that is it, has been found on the battlefield site. And this is something that people often use to level at this location as not being the site because the archaeological evidence is so little. However, look around the archaeological evidence of any medieval battle and it is scarce you're not looking at battlefield detritus like you get in modern warfare so for anything post 20th century battlefield archaeology battlefield archaeology of the first world war second world war even going back to napoleonics is different hand-to-hand -hand fighting doesn't involve shrapnel shells, it doesn't involve bullets, it doesn't involve these single one-way weapons where once they've gone they will fall there of no use and they will just be left there to work their way into the ground. 11th century battles weren't like that. Weapons that were used, swords, spears, axes, had monetary value and so when the, when the battlefield, when the battle was over and the Normans moved away even if the Normans hadn't done it themselves, people would have come on, they would have taken things, male vests, worth a lot of money, swords, worth extensive a lot of money, axes, worth a lot of money. And so these items would have been picked, and this, these battlefields would have been picked clean by the local inhabitants or the conquering army. And so other than maybe a few arrowheads, very little would have gone into the ground. Plus also you're looking one day's battle. 
you're not looking at this tumultuous amount of time that say for example the Battle of the Somme lasts for whereby a dud shell lands and then over the course of months of more firing of shells that that becomes more and more that becomes buried and that's where the, these items are still being raised from now obviously there's one thing that has never been found on this site or close to it at which would result which possibly would resolve it entirely and that's burials now again neither potiers in his writings or the biotapestry show what happened to the dead bodies there's a brief glimpse about harold but harold's a different matter harold whether you devise him as king of england or not is, is a dubious matter but harold is would be a different matter his body would need to be disposed of and so that comes down to the Harold burial site, but that's a different story in a minute. So Harold, but the generic infantryman of the day, that general squad, where would he be? Well, we don't know. We don't know how they, were, how they were disposed, how those bodies were disposed of. Now, the Abbey construction starts quite soon afterwards, potentially, they're under there. Foundation, things like that, the body's moved. Were they pired? Most likely, most probably. Were they just left? Just left, and obviously you're looking at a period where while boar would have been around um, wolves, possibly. Certainly the wild wildlife of this area of England will be remarkably different to what it is today and so those if they were just left they would have just been eaten and again would leave no trace so in all likelihood they were either they would be left out there on the field until nature takes its course or they would have been uh, pired quite quite quickly after the battle in which case you would there will there be deposits out there to find it will be a lot harder to find those deposits than it will be to try and find mass graves so that leads us into that so ordinarily do, do we believe do i believe the battle location is here yes because the evidence suggests that this is the site do i believe that that is the battlefield most likely but it, there's a potential it could be this way as well we just we just don't know 900 years of cultivation has completely changed the landscape here okay there's now a town <laughs> there was no town here okay the town the abbey's built now this is another point about the abbey you go to any abbeys elsewhere in the country and the abbeys are always in the valley you think of Tinton abbey in Monmouthshire you think of Ivor abbey in Yorkshire they're in the valleys close to the water source why is this abbey on the very top very pinnacle of the ridge line why because there's something important that needs to be marked again and makes it unusual makes you think that that's possibly why it's in that place so that leads us on to the final question final couple of questions in terms of harold so harold his body is located his mother and his mistress come down and identify the body by these certain marks are placed upon the body. So William refuses to give the body up and orders one of his troops to bury it. Now, for years past, the believed burial site was Waltham Abbey in Essex. Now, there's a number of reasons why it was believed to be brought from Abbey in Essex. Certainly one of them is that it's one of the only abbeys in the country that doesn't get the the normalisation that you'll see that will happen elsewhere where all the great abbeys are torn down and they're rebuilt in the Roman, Norman Roman style. That doesn't happen at Waltham Abbey. There's only two that don't get the, doesn't get, get this treatment. Westminster Abbey, which had only just been consecrated 
almost in time for William, um, Edward the Confessor's funeral, where William would be crowned. And the reason why is that that's already been built in the Romanesque style due to it being Edward's cathedral, Edward's Abbey, and he has built it in the model of the great Norman abbeys of the, 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 the great Norman abbeys of Caen, of Mont Saint Michel, etc. So it doesn't need it, it, it's already in their image. The other one is Waltham Abbey, and this goes into this story that it, the burial place of Harold because it's his mausoleum. You're not going to pull down this abbey and build this grand structure over the top of your vanquished foe. The other, the other suggestion, and that links into what was said in the final century sentences of Poitiers, and that is that Hamwood was to be buried by the sea to overlook and guard the coast that he so desperately wanted to save. And that links to the earlier scenes of the biotapestry where Hamwood leaves to go to Normandy. And that location is a place called Bosham, which is down in Sussex, a few, it's in West Sussex, so it's a few miles down the coast, heading towards Portsmouth direction, the other side of Brighton from here. And where, and there's a small, fairly small parish church. But what's interesting is that a burial there was uncovered, the body was exhumed, I'll tell you a few years, like several years ago, and it does show signs of damage to the body. And interestingly, some of the cuts on the show signs of the body, in fact, that one, one leg is, all, is pretty much severed, does link to that scene in the biotapestry. So was that potentially Howard's skeleton that was removed? Again, we don't know, um, but it links to that story. So potentially, so was he buried at at Waltham Abbey, probably not, was he more likely buried uh, in his local parish church at Busham on Sea. Most, again, the evidence, if you look at the writings and possibly the skeleton that's come out, yeah, it kind of does look like it might be. Like, there, there's, there does seem some more evidence to it. So, and so that's, that's the story here, that battle, like I say, you, you have got the Abbey itself, story for another day. Um, the abbey itself was di dismantled during Henry VIII's, um, Henry VIII's time in the Reformation and so all that remains today is the refectory building. You've got the, the, the buildings of the um, Battle Abbey School now that cover some of the dormitory buildings and then obviously using stones and things like that but we're just going to move up here just to have a look and discuss one more topic. Uh, so we're just walking now along the side of the abbey walls and this leads us to the final part of the story which was alluded to very briefly in Poitiers and that's what the incident called the Malfoss incident and it's one of the reasons why this location has sometimes been accused of not being the correct location. So Malfoss incident takes place at the end of the battle. So the Malfoss incident takes place at the end of the battle where the troops of William's troops that are chasing the fleeing, Nor fleeing English encounter a large ditch or ravine off the back of the battlefield. Now we have to bear in mind 900 years of history, a town has developed, etc. Okay, but the, the battlefield has altered significantly within that time frame. So where was it? Because I remember when I first came here many years ago, it used to discuss about the Malfoss being actually on the battlefield down there, which obviously it clearly isn't, there's no ravine there. Um, however, with hindsight, you can say, Certainly, if you look at the town, when you go out into the town, it's, there's, a, there's a large undulation in, in the high street. Could that be filled in and cover that area, possibly? Um, obviously, as you go out of the town, if you're driving back towards A21, um, it drops down off of the ridge 
quite significantly so again there could be areas within there that potentially could be the Malfoss itself if you look at the front cover of the book Stephen Morello book that I've been quoting from today he's locating the Malfoss off to the rear and to the left of the battlefield so there's a number of if you look at the contours of the map there's a number of uh, possibilities as to where the Malfoss incident occurs obviously like I said uh, previously 900 years of geographical change has affected all of what we see so sometimes we can't read for gospel what we see in the landscape today as what we saw back then but um, the Malfoss incident is one of those in another incidents that people point towards to say well where is it if this is the location well it's here it's just not right at the battlefield if, if you read the script through again read the script you will un you will see, see that actually it happens in the aftermath of the battle so it doesn't necessarily mean it happens right here it could happen mile two miles five miles away so that's just an insight into the Malfoss and we've now come back round to the main gate of the um, of the Abbey here, and that concludes today's tour.